Hey, hello, welcome back. I am Pastor Steve. Our church is La Vina de Gracia here in La Caleta, Colombia. We are in episode five of our series on the Armageddon, the apocalypse, how you can survive and actually thrive. Um, we are going to be briefly looking at the final in the future dispensations today and in upcoming episodes we will go into more detail now up until now it has been relatively easy to understand the previous dispensations and their events but the upcoming dispensations are a little more complicated to understand because they involve not one but two major battles, namely the battle that will take place at the end of the dispensation of tribulation and the battle that will take place at the end of the dispensation of the millennial reign of Christ. That's the thousand year reign of Christ here on the earth. Now, add to this the rapture of the church and when it will happen. This is not to be confused with the second coming of Christ to the earth. These are distinctly different events. Now, plus, add to this the appearance of the city in the sky, the new Jerusalem, and the way that the revelations of the Apostle John um, were described and written, especially considering that the events in the book of Revelations are not always written in a chronological manner. You can see why there can be misunderstandings um, of the sequence and timing of future events. So we have previously discussed the dispensations of innocence, conscience, human government, promise, law, and grace, or the church age, which is the dispensation that we are in today. Um, I want to talk to you briefly about the dispensations of tribulation, and that will include um, the rapture of the church and Armageddon, and the dispensation of the millennial reign of Christ, followed by the new beginnings. Now, dispensations, if you're new to us and have not watched any of the previous four episodes, dispensations are the different ways that God has chosen to relate to us. Now, even though the requirements and expectations of a holy God have never changed, the methods that he uses have been modified to allow us as sinners to be able to be in a close and personal relationship with him, which is why he created us in the first place. Now, after Christ came to fulfill the law, God established the dispensation of grace. And we've discussed these two dispensations, uh, the dispensation of law and the dispensation of grace, in the last episode. The stewards of this dispensation that we're in now, the dispensation of the church or of grace, is, is more specifically geared towards the church. The time period of this dispensation will be from the day of Pentecost, and it will run until uh, the rapture of the church, give or take. And remember that the changing from, or the moving from one dispensation to the next dispensation is a lot like the seasons um, of, of time. Uh, when we go from spring to summer, it doesn't happen overnight. It's a gradual transition. Um, you will realize that you are in summer when you are, uh, when you realize that it is hot, it has been hot for some time, and you are now in the season of summer. This is uh, the changing of dispensations. We've talked about this previously. The church's responsibility in this dispensation is to grow in maturity and understanding and in sanctification and to become more like Christ. Um, but the church is continually failing in this regard. Um, our worldliness um, is more and more evident, and many churches are falling into apostasy. 
So God has issued a judgment upon the church and has allowed blindness towards apostasy and false doctrine to consume many of them. But God, in his faithfulness and mercy, continues to offer grace and the forgiveness of sins through faith in Christ Jesus. So let's take a look at the end of grace and the beginning of tribulation. Again, this is a transition that we're moving into these days. So what is tribulation? The book of Revelations describes a series of events that are called the dispensation of tribulation. And we're going to briefly touch upon some of these events. Without much argument, I think we could all agree that this is not going to be a very pleasant time here on the earth. But if we take another look at the dispensations from the point of view of the Lord, turn in your Bibles to Psalms chapter 90, verse 4. Psalms 90, verse 4. And we read that, For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. For as a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. In the night. Let's go over to the New Testament to 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. We see that it says, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. When we consider the point of view from God's perspective, and we see that these dispensations last in our point of view of time, uh, a long time. The dispensation of grace has lasted roughly 2,000 years. Um, other dispensations have lasted 1,600 years. Some were shorter, some were in between. We might consider that this dispensation of tribulation is like the Lord is saying, you've had enough time to understand the program, if you will. Enough is enough. The Lord is saying, Enough is enough. So God's judgments during the tribulation are pictured as seven seals um, being opened up one at a time. The seven seals are one of a series of end-time judgments from God. These seals are described in Revel Revelations chapter 6, verses 1 through 17, and in Revelations chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. In John's vision, the seven seals hold closed a scroll in heaven, and as each seal is broken, a new judgment is unleashed upon the earth. Following the seal judgment are the trumpet judgment and the bowl judgment. The seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls are three series of end-time judgments from God. The judgments get increasingly worse and more devastating as end times progress. If you remember um, what happened in, uh, to Pharaoh in Egypt, every time that Moses would say, let my people go, Pharaoh would refuse or he would renege on his promise to let the people go and the judgment that would fall upon pharaoh in egypt became prog progressively worse this is the same thing the seven seals trumpets and bowls are connected to one another the seventh seal introduces the seven trumpets and the seventh trumpet introduces the seven bowls, the Revelations chapter 11, 15 through 19, and Revelations chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. The seven bowl judgments are the final judgments of the tribulation period. They will be the most severe judgments the world has ever seen. 
The seven bowls are described in Revelation chapter 16, verses 1 through 21, where they are specifically called the seven bowls of God's wrath. And we'll be looking um, in an upcoming episode in, in much more detail as to what these judgments are. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, under the Antichrist, the during this tribulation period, the wickedness of man has reached its peak and has met with God's wrath against sin. God is incredibly patient, but there are limits and under the time that we're in. If we take a look at what's going on around us, uh, we, we, can, we can look at where things are in the world today with people, their relationship with God, um, their uh, involvement in, in particular sins, and uh, we we can refer back in history to Sodom and Gomorrah and see how God dealt with that. We go back further and we look at uh, Noah's flood and see the the depravity of man's heart and uh, the condition. Um, of his heart, and we can see God does have a limit uh, in patience with us. So, one of the angels of the seven bold judgments um, shows John the fate of Babylon the Great, this is Revelation 17, as God avenges the blood of the prophets and of God's holy people of all who have been slaughtered on the earth. Revelation chapter 18, verse 24. The world mourns the fall of Babylon, but heaven rejoices. And this is in Revelation chapter 19. Jesus Christ then returns in glory to defeat the armies of the Antichrist at Armageddon, uh, Revelation 19, 11 through 21. And then he sets up his kingdom, the millennial reign of Christ on earth, Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 6. The word woe means grief, anguish, affliction. And the three woes of Revelation are the final judgment God pronounces on the evil inhabitants of the earth in order to spur them to repentance. Remember, God's heart is that all should come to repentance, none should perish. That's his heart. Everything he does um, is to, um, to encourage people to repent and to seek him and his, his forgiveness for their sins. The three woes then are indeed a time of great anguish and affliction for those who have pledged their allegiance, allegiances to the Antichrist during the end times. The number seven is very significant in Revelations, and the three woes come towards the end of the seven-year tribulation period, right before the second coming of Jesus Christ. God's judgments during the tribulation period are pictured as seven seals being opened up one at a time. The seventh seal reveals the seven trumpet judgments. The fifth, sixth, and seventh trumpets are called the three woes. Revelation chapter 8, verse 13. So let me ask, what about salvation? During these times, what about salvation? Now, we do know that some people will be saved during the tribulation. Uh, you can read this in Revelations chapter 7, 9 through 14. And we, we know that uh, it will end at the Battle of Armageddon when Jesus Christ will return and defeat Satan and any who would follow him into battle. This is Revelations chapter 19, uh, verses 11 through Revelations chapter 20, verse 3. And we read in Revelation chapter 7, verses, verse 9 through 14, After this I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. 
verse 10, and they cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne, and about the elders and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God, saying, in verse 12, Amen, blessing and glory, wisdom and thanksgiving, and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. Verse 13, And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and where do they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, these are they which came out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. This means that salvation will be very different in this dispensation of tribulation than from what we have been blessed with in this current dispensation of grace. Let me say that again. People will be saved in the tribulation, but the means will be very different. Um, Revelations chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Let me pause here. I, I think a lot of us are, we may, are crying out the same thing. We may not use these words, but I think our heart cries are, Lord, how much longer are you going to wait? How much more patience are you going to have towards our enemies or against our enemies before you judge them? Let's move on. Verse 11. And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Revelations chapter 12, verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. In other words, salvation now is by faith in Jesus Christ and his atoning um, sacrifice death and resurrection for and shedding of his blood for our sins but in very short time in the dispensation of tribulations salvation is going to be by the word of their testimony and their life the 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 bible says from the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks and by confession we become saved in the tribulation, if you are not saved now, in the tribulation, to be saved, you will testify of your love for Christ, and it will cost you your life. Now, during this dispensation, God will pour out his wrath and judgment upon the earth. The rapture of the church, as we have read, is a real event that is yet to take place. There is little argument about this, although there is much disagreement as to when this event, the rapture, will actually take place. There are four, basically there are four different ways that this might happen, and they all revolve around what is called the Great Tribulation. Some think that this is actually the dispensation of the Great Tribulation, while others think that it will be a continuation of the dispensation of the church age. In other words, some people believe that 
after the dispensation of grace will come the dispensation of the millennial reign of Christ, which, as the name suggests, will last for a thousand years. They believe that the tribulation is part of the dispensation of grace. Others believe that following the church age will then come the dispensation of tribulation, which will last seven years, and it will then be followed by the dispensation of the millennial reign of Christ. Regardless of when it happens or what it will be called, the dispensation of tribulation will be very destructive but it will not be the final event in the history of mankind. No, it is at this point that there is some confusion and misunderstandings of things yet to come. So I want to briefly touch upon each of these four possibilities. One possibility is called pre-tribulation rapture meaning that the church will be raptured or pulled out of the world before the tribulation begins. Another possibility is called the mid-tribulation rapture, which is a belief that the church will go through the first three, three and a half years of tribulation, and then we will be taken out of um, the world and into heaven for a period of time. Another uh, possibility is known as the post-tribulation rapture, which, as the name implies, means we will go through the tribulation and then be pulled out. Another possibility is that there is, is what's called a pan-rapture, which is a bit of a tongue-in-cheek way of saying it will all pan out for those who are ready. It'll, it'll all be okay for those who are ready. In other words, hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. So we will take a look and see how these different possibilities lead to very different levels of relationship and faith in the church today. And, and we'll see how these possibilities are supported or not supported by scriptures in upcoming episodes. And we will be returning to this dispensation of tribulation in one of our next episodes. And we'll go into much more details as to what we can expect to see happening, as well as what we can do to be better prepared for these catastrophic events. Hope for the best, prepare for the worst. Not a bad um, philosophy. Now, towards the very end of the dispensation of tribulation will be the Battle of Armageddon. What is it? When is it? The word Armageddon is used generically today to refer to any type of catastrophic conflict, especially if it's likely to result in widespread destruction or annihilation of human life. In the Bible, Armageddon refers to a climactic future battle between God and the forces of evil, as recorded in the book of Revelations. Um, the word ultimately comes from the Hebrew word Armageddon, which means Mount Megiddo, the predicted location of the battle. And in one of our next episodes, we'll be taking a look at what the Bible or how the Bible describes and explains the events that will happen from heaven on coming into earth and what that is most likely to, to look like from our perspective. Now, my view or understanding of Revelations is that the Battle of Armageddon will be a real battle in the future near the end of the tribulation period. Demonic influences will cause the kings of the earth to gather their armies together for an all-out assault on Jerusalem. The Antichrist will be leading the charge. You can read this in Revelations chapter 16, verses 13 through 16. Jesus Christ will return to the earth with the armies of heaven. Rev uh, Matthew 25, 31, Revelation 19, 14. His feet will touch, or he will stand physically on the Mount of Olives, Zechariah 14, chapter, uh, chapter 14, verse 4, and he will defeat the forces of evil, Revelation 19, verses 15 and 16. 
he will cast the Antichrist and the false prophet into the lake of fire. You read this in Revelation chapter 19, verse 20. He will bind Satan, and Satan will be bound for a, for a thousand years. Jesus will set up his kingdom on the earth for that thousand years. Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 6. At Armageddon, the Lord Jesus treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath, wrath of God Almighty, um, and all things will be made right. Revelations chapter 16, 19. And we read that, I saw heaven standing open, and there was before me a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses, dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. We're going to come back to this in, in the next episode. Uh, why does God have to rule with an iron scepter, uh, an iron fist, a uh, 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 um, a hard hand. Interesting, interesting thing we need to take a look at. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty on his robe and on his thigh. He has written, he, on his thigh, he has his name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, Come, gather together for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and the mighty, of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, great and small. Things are going to be really disastrous for those who are not um, following Jesus. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who had performed the signs on its behalf. With these signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest were killed with the sword coming out of the mouth of the rider on the horse, and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. This begins the next dispensation, which is called the Millennial Kingdom of Christ, or the Millennial Reign of Christ, and it will last for a thousand years as Christ himself rules on earth. This kingdom will fulfill the prophecy to the Jewish nation that Christ will, rec will return and be their king. The only people allowed to enter the New Jerusalem, and we'll talk about that in, the, uh, in one of the next episodes, the only people who will be allowed to enter the New Jerusalem are the born-again believers from the age of grace, righteous survivors of the seven years of tribulation, and the resurrected Old Testament saints. No unsaved person is allowed access into this kingdom. Satan is bound during the thousand years. This period ends with the final judgment, Revelations chapter 20, 11 through 14. The old world will be destroyed by fire, and there will be a new heavens and a new earth. And we re read this in Revelations chapter 21 and chapter 22. Uh, the new heavens and the, the new earth will then begin. The millennial kingdom begins with the defeat of Satan, ushers in a thousand years of peace where Christ will reign on the earth. This is a fulfillment of many prophecies declaring that Christ will return and be king. 
excuse me, Satan will be bound in hell for a thousand years, unable to interfere in the affairs of mankind. After the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released. People will again follow Satan in a battle against God, and they will be defeated again. This is the final battle. Revelations chapter 20, verses 7 through 10. There will then be a final judgment of all people, great and small. Revelations 20, 11 through 15. The old earth and heaven will be destroyed by fire. Remember, God promised um, Noah that he would never destroy the earth by flood again and gave us the sign of that covenant as our, our rainbow is a sign of that covenant. Satan will then be thrown into the lake of fire. This will begin the eternal kingdom, the new heavens and the new earth, Revelations 21 and 22. Revelations 21 verse 4 says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. Well, what about salvation during the millennial reign? That's a really good question. I'm not sure that I have an answer for you, but we will take a look at what life is going to be like during the dispensation of the millennial reign of Christ, and we'll we'll try to discover what is what will salvation be like. Will there even be the offer of salvation? Or will everybody be have been uh, sealed um, eternally by that point? Good questions. Let's look at uh, Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. And we're about at the end of this, uh, this episode here. During the reigns of those kings... The God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed or conquered. It will crush all these kingdoms into nothingness, and it will stand forever. That is the meaning of the rock cut from the mountain, though not by human hand that crushed to pieces the statue of iron, bronze, clay, silver, and gold. The great God was showing the king what will happen in the future. The dream is true, and its meaning is certain. The word of God is absolute, not obsolete. Let me say that again. The word of God is absolute, not obsolete. The stories in the Bible are not there just for our entertainment, but they are there for our understanding of the principles of the kingdom of God. This dispensation uh, brings about the culmination of life on earth and the closest thing yet to how God really wanted to live with us on this planet. As its name suggests, the millennial kingdom of, of Christ will last for a thousand years. Um, this dispensation is referred to in Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 10. The stewards of this dispensation will be the resurrected Old Testament saints, the glorified church, and the survivors of the tribulation and their descendants. The period of time will be from the second coming of Christ until the final rebellion a period of about 1,000 years. The responsibility of people will be to, to be obedient, remain undefiled, and to worship the Lord Jesus. We have two references for us in the Old Testament. One is Isaiah uh, chapter 11, verses 3, 4, and 5, and Zechariah chapter 14, verse 9. The failure is that after Satan is loosed from the abyss where he's been bound for a thousand years, sinful man rebels one more time. Even after a thousand years of perfect peace, government, rule, and reign, sinful man rebels one more time. Re- Revelations 20, 7 through 9. The judgment that will fall is fire from God. Then the great white throne judgment, 
Revelations 20, verses 9 through 15. The grace that God extends is that Jesus will restore creation and he rules righteously in Israel with all of the saints, the church, assisting. Isaiah 11, 1 through 5, Matthew 25, 31 to 46, and Revelation chapter 20. The millennial kingdom will be a time characterized by peace. Isaiah 11, 6 through 7, Micah chapter 4, verse 3. Justice, uh, Isaiah 11, 3 and 4. Unity, Isaiah 11, 10. Abundance, Isaiah 35, 1 and 2. Healing, Isaiah 35, 5 and 6. And we need, we'll take a look at these as we go into the, the upcoming episodes, um, why these will be there and what, what are the implications of that. Righteousness, Isaiah 35, verse 8. Joy, Isaiah 55, verse 12. And the physical presence of Christ, Isaiah 16, verse 5. Uh, remember that Satan will be bound in the abyss during this period. The Messiah Jesus will be the benevolent ruler king, ruler ruling over the entire world, and the resurrected saint of all time will participate in the management of the government. Revelations 20, verses 4, 5, and 6. The millennial kingdom is measurable. And it comes after the kingdom of God embodied in Jesus Christ came to man during the dispensation of grace. On Jesus' first visit to the earth, he brought grace. At his second coming, he will execute justice and usher in the millennium. Jesus mentioned his glorious return at his trial before the Sanhedrin, uh, reference Mark 14, verse 62. And he was referring to the millennial kingdom when he taught his disciples to pray, Thy kingdom come, Matthew 6, 10. This is the age of the millennial kingdom of Christ. The stewards of this age will be the resurrected Old Testament saints, the saved in the church, and the survivors of the tribulation. It starts at the second coming of Christ, and it will end at the final rebellion, which is a time of 1,000 years. The responsibility of these people is to be obedient and to worship Jesus. But after Satan is loosed, man will rebel once more. God will then issue judgment of fire um, and the great white throne judgment. God is gracious he will restore creation. He will rule over all of Israel. Then we have what I call the dispensation of new beginnings. And, the, and there's a final rebellion, which we've, we've mentioned a couple of times here. Their rebellion at the end of the millennial kingdom uh, seems almost incredible. Mankind will have been living in a perfect environment with every need cared for, overseen by a truly just government. Now, isn't that going to be a change that we could get accustomed to very quickly? A truly just government. And we read this in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 5. Yet the people think they can do better by doing things their way. Man simply cannot maintain the perfection that God requires on their own. Mankind, again, follows Satan any and every chance that he gets. This is going to give us an insight as to what is salvation most likely going to be, going to be like or what is required for salvation in the millennial reign of Christ. Um, at the end of the millennial, their final rebellion is crushed. Satan will be cast into the lake of fire. Then comes the white throne judgment, where all the unrighteous of all the dispensations will be judged according to their works and also cast into the lake of fire. Revelations chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. After the final judgment, God and his people will live forever in the new Jerusalem, with a new heavens and a new earth. 
God's plan of redemption will have been completely realized and the redeemed will know God and enjoy him forever. The final result, the new heaven and the new earth, this period ends with the final judgment in Revelation 20. The old world is destroyed by fire. The new heaven and the new earth in Revelation 21 and 22 will begin. In upcoming episode, we will be looking at the implications and um, getting a, a, a better idea as to what's in store for those who love him. So until then, God bless you. Thank you for your faithfulness in following with us and staying with us. Thank you, and we will see you next time. All right, God bless you.